Erev Tov, good evening everyone, um, or good afternoon, uh, depending where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Paul Gross, I'm a senior fellow here at the Menachem Begin Heritage Centre. Uh, I know many of you uh, know that, <laughs> you've been on these uh, meetings before. Um, we've been doing these meetings now for several months um, with different speakers looking at different issues around Israeli politics and history, um, lectures, discussions, and, um, and all manner of... Um, of uh, educational and intellectual pursuits. Uh, we are now at the third episode in a series that we're doing, looking at um, key events uh, in Israeli history that have shaped the state of Israel, um, that have made it a, that have changed in certain ways, uh, the direction of the country. Um, uh, last week, uh, those of you who were here uh, will recall we looked at the the Ma'apach, the election of Benachem Begin, and specifically the economic and socioeconomic uh, changes uh, that were wrought by that government and the move from a, a socialist uh, economy to free market. Um, what we're going to look at today um, that took place in the early 90s, I think is in many ways no less consequential. Um, and uh, we'll hear from our speaker about it, but certainly my feeling is that if we look at Israeli politics today, um, especially as the sort of old, this old big divide um, between the left and the right on um, uh, what to do about the uh, uh, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, and the Palestinian <coughs> issue, and two-state solution, negotiated deal, whatever, because that debate is somewhat sterile at the moment um, because there's a, there's a kind of weary consensus in Israel that there's no one to talk to on the other side. Um, I think we can see that a, a big divide currently in Israeli politics is precisely about the issue that we're going to discuss uh, this evening um, about the role of the Supreme Court um, in Israeli life, in Israeli politics, um, and what actually um, democracy uh, means in Israel and is in Israel. Um, okay, so um, we're going to hear uh, after our speaker's presentation, there's going to be uh, time for questions. Um, you can write those questions into the chat box um, as, um, as many of you who've been on this, these meetings before will know. Um, our speaker has also said that he'd be happy to take people's verbal questions as well. If you want to do that, um, you can indicate to me either by writing in the chat or by sticking a virtual or real hand up and I will unmute you for you to ask a, a verbal question, or you can do it the, uh, the, the, the old fashioned way and write it in the chat box and I will read it out. Um, okay, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce uh, our speaker. Um, I'm very uh, delighted and privileged to have with us uh, here this evening, Dr. Amir Fuchs, who is director of the Defending Democratic Values Program at the Israel Democracy Institute. Uh, he has a doctorate from the Faculty of Law Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He's a lecturer in politics and communication at the School of Government and Social Sciences at Hadassah Academic College. Uh, he's also someone that I personally have learned an awful lot from uh, in the uh, lectures that he has done for other groups that I've that I've run here at the Vegan Center um, and the organization that he works for, the Israel Democracy Institute, I think is one of the really outstanding um, institutions and think tanks. Uh, operating in Israel today. So I'm going to mute myself and pass over to Dr. Fuchs. Thank you, Amir. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for having me. And thank you all for being here. Um, I'll start maybe a few words about IDI um, because it might be one of the first questions. So IDI is uh, maybe the biggest think tank in Israel that deals with uh, politics, deals with law, with um, also making polls, the, the famous democracy index um, about economy, a lot of research uh, in, in IDI. I must say uh, a few disclaimers. First, um, that we are not partisans. We are not uh, funded or uh, funded by the state or a part of any uh, specific uh, party, but 
and, and we, we claim that we are non-political in that way, but of course, everything we deal with is political. Uh, so, and, and of course, I, I don't say that we don't have an agenda. We do have an agenda of what is a liberal democracy and we want to promote it in Israel. So I w- want to say it as, at first. So uh, I will present a lot of facts, but also a lot of observations and my, um, my opinion as, as a legal expert. But of course, some legal experts think different and it's okay, but, but I, I want to put it on the table. Uh, and there are legal uh, experts that will say the opposite from, from what I'm saying, but I will try to persuade you that I'm right. Um, anyway, so um, I'll just start. Uh, I have a presentation, but it's only tentative. Uh, and, and according to the questions at the end, we can, we can uh, talk about other things. But I will just, uh, it, it will be first uh, some background about the constitutional, the constitutional situation in Israel. How did we get there? And then about the, what we call the constitutional revolution, a little bit about the laws itself and the basic laws themselves and about uh, the implications. And also I would say a lot, uh, I would say uh, some things about the counter revolution that we are now uh, being presented. It, it didn't happen yet, but uh, it, it's clearly uh, what a uh, very big part of the political um, debate today is, should we have a counter-revolution uh, against the, that revolution that we went through in the 90s? So let's, let us start. Um, let's see how it works. Okay. Okay. Is it up? It's okay, Paul? Okay. So I'll just start with with what we had uh, when we just established uh, Israel. We didn't have a constitution, as everybody knows. I will say a few words about that uh, in in a few minutes. But we did have a declaration of independence, which is maybe the most important uh, um, paper that we had on, on the, when the, the state was just established. And there, was, there is still today a debate about what is the nature of Israel democracy? Is it a liberal democracy? Is it just uh, you know, a procedural democracy that has nothing uh, uh, apart from the rule of the majority? And we can see, see clearly from the Declaration of Invents, of course, this is just one of the uh, important paragraphs of the, of the Declaration. But you can see that uh, it has some kind of a bill of rights. It says that um, uh, it will foster the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. It will be based on freedom, justice, and peace. And as envisioned by the prophets of Israel, it will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its, its inhabitants, respective of religion, race, and sex. Uh, it will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, like language, education, and culture. It will safeguard the holy places of all religions. I must say, this is, this is just one paragraph, of course. We have a lot of paragraphs that talk about the, uh, na- the Jewish nation of the state, specifically about the, the, the Jewish nation state that it is supposed to be. Uh, but this is also uh, an important uh, the, um, paragraph that says that we are supposed to be uh, a liberal democracy that has uh, rights of individuals, that have certainly the right for equality for all its inhabitants, all of its citizens. So this is what we had at the beginning. We had the Declaration of Independence. It is not a constitution, although some people tried to claim that it is. There were petitions to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court definitely said this is not a constitution. But we did have um, decisions of the Supreme Court from the 50s towards the 80s that said, this is not a constitution, but we do uh, take, uh, when we interpret regular laws, we do take the declaration as a spiritual, um, it, it gives us a way of inter- interpret, interpreting the laws that when, when we can, 
when the the the, 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 uh, the judges when they can they do protect human rights therefore they had very important uh, decisions from the 50s to the 80s although we didn't have any kind of bill of rights we didn't have any basic law that says that we have uh, human rights but they did give power to for human rights only by uh, decisions of the court and if you ask me when was the court most activist it was these years because they made human rights in Israel without any um, substantial basic law like they did have later in the 90s for me this is the most activist time of the Supreme Court I wanted to say something about the Harari decision because if you know uh, the only um, uh, the, the only uh, job that the Knesset had in the Declaration of Independence was to constitute a constitution. This is the only thing the first Knesset had to do, and it, of course it failed to do that. They became uh, not only the constitutional uh, uh, body, but also the legislative body, and therefore they, they decided not to constitute the constitution. Of course, there is a lot of deliberation. Why did they do it? We can, I can just summarize by the most important three arguments that, you, that they had. First, that, of course, we can't agree. It is uh, very hard to agree. We all have different opinions on what is supposed to be written there. So, therefore, we will just wait and not agree now. The second and, and very important, uh, very famous uh, reason for not constituting a constitution is the, um, um, the fact that uh, ultra-Orthodox and some of the uh, uh, Orthodox uh, people just refused, uh, uh, as a principle, a constitution. They said, we, had, we have as a constitution the Torah. Although we want to have regular laws, we don't need some kind of uh, uh, sacred uh, uh, piece of paper. We, ha we do have the Torah. And third, and I think which is a little persuasive, is the fact that the, the, this is the, the, the state of the Jewish people. And most of the Jewish people weren't here. Most of the Jewish people were in the diaspora, and they said, we don't have the mandate now to uh, constitute the constitution. Let's wait until millions of people will come. But if you ask me, the real reason was that Mapai and Ben-Gurion didn't want a constitution. A constitution is um, census. It says what the government cannot do. It gives rights for the opposition. It gives, think about uh, the Tsena. I'm not sure about the, uh, Paul, maybe you can help me with the word about, how would you uh, translate Tsena? All the laws about uh, regulating the, the, um, the food and all that in the first years, it doesn't go right with a liberal bill of rights uh, when you, uh, don't allow people to buy and uh, to work as they, as they please. And of course, the military regime of the Arabs, actually, it wasn't really... Um, Mapai and uh, Ben-Gurion didn't really want a, a liberal constitution on right after they, they uh, established the state. They said maybe it's a good idea, but only in the future. And therefore, they decided not to enact the constitution, but they did decide that instead of a full constitution, there will be um, basic laws, which at the end, someone will gather it together and make it a constitution. So we are still in this um, transit transitive time of living in, the, in, in a country that don't have a constitution, but have a basic law, basic laws that are our quasi-constitution. Uh, and they are our substitute for a constitution, not only by the interpretation of the court. You can see it also in the Knesset, that the Knesset sees the basic laws as a higher normative uh, a law than a regular law. And even before the, the 99 uh, uh, constitutional revolution, it was very clear that the basic laws are above the regular laws. And there was even in, in the 80s, uh, some de decision of the court that uh, uh, if there is a specific uh, majority uh, that you need to have to change the basic law, then if a regular law does not have that majority, then that law is unconstitutional. So 
it was like uh, uh, there was an agreement about that the fact that the basic laws are above the regular laws i don't say that it's not a revolutionary i will say why but still it the the the, the fact that basic laws are on a higher normative uh, standard it, it was very clear from the harari decision and from the beginning now we did have regime basic laws from the 50s and 60s and 70s. It means basic law about the government and about the Knesset and about the army and about um, the, the court. We had a lot of basic laws, but we didn't have any, even one basic law that deals with human rights whatsoever. And it is very strange when you have a constitution that doesn't deal with human rights. The, maybe the most important, but one of the most important um, fact, uh, uh, components of the Constitution is the Bill of Rights. It is there in every Constitution, but we didn't have it. You, you can ask yourself why, and of course, the, the reason was that there was a problem to get a uh, uh, consensus about what will be written in these uh, uh, human rights, in this Bill of Rights, and specifically, most of the problems were about equality, of course, because of the issues of a, a religious uh, questions that uh, arise from the fact that you give a right for equality, for example, for women, or equality, if we think from today uh, uh, point of view, uh, LGBT rights, you have a lot of issues of equality de de deriving from a, a religious issue, but also when you think of Israel as a Jewish in the national uh, aspect, then if you give equality, then you give full equality for citizens which are not Jewish. And this is also a big question that we are still dealing with. So this is just um, examples of the fact that made the big controversy that just prevented us from enacting any laws that give human rights. But as I said, the Supreme Court actually uh, recognized that we do have human rights even before 1992, but only as a power for, to interpret regular laws, but never to strike down laws because they are contradicting human rights, because he didn't have a basic law that says we have human rights. Then we had the, the, what happened in 1992. And I, I must say that if you ask as a person in Israel today, I think that most people, maybe the vast majority, we, when you ask them, who made the constitutional revolution? I wasn't sure, or almost sure, they would say the Supreme Court. Some of them even will say Aaron Barak. But this is totally, in my opinion, false. Of course, the Supreme Court had a big role in the Constitutional Revolution, but the biggest role, or the most important role, was of the Knesset. The Supreme Court did not enact these two laws, the law uh, about uh, liberty and human dignity and the law of freedom of occupation. So in 1992, the Knesset enacted two laws that deal with human rights. Um, the process was, it started from a general law of human rights, and because they faced the same uh, difficulties as always, dealing with equality, uh, dealing also with the questions of freedom of speech and issues of um, um, freedom of speech versus uh, security and all that. And then they narrow it down to two laws that they could uh, agree upon, the, the human dignity and liberty and the freedom of occupation. And I must say that although a lot of people now accuse the Knesset of the, then 1992, uh, that it, it, has, it had a small majority, only a few of the, the Knesset uh, voted for it. Well, it's true that there were only 30-something that voted for, but there were all, only 20-something that voted against. And the 30-something the that voted for were from a lot of different parties. We must uh, remember, this was a Likud government. The Minister of Justice who promoted that was from Likud, Dan Merido, the head of the uh, Constitutional uh, Committee in the Knesset was Uriel Lin from Likud. 
And of course, they had cooperation with the liberals from the left, but also among the people who voted for it was uh, Mafdal, the rabbi uh, Yitzhak Levi. So although it didn't have a vast majority, it had a strong majority from a lot of uh, parties. And everyone who knows how the Knesset works, when a, when a law passes with 30-something against 20-something, it was because there was, a, uh, uh, like, everybody knew that it will pass. When a law is under a big controversy, it passes with 62 against 58. And some people say, well, this law passed with a 62 majority. Well, a 62 against 58 means that they sat all night and thought about it. But when something is just going there, when half of the Knesset is not there, it's when everybody knows there is a, a, a clear majority for it. Anyway, they did pass this law, and, and I want to take a, a little bit, uh, to talk a little bit about the, um, the content. First, um, one important issue is that we all know Israel as what we call Jewish and democratic. But it wasn't so clear then, because this is the first legislation paper that said that, uh, that uh, had this phrase of Jewish and democratic state. And this was also some kind of a compromise in order to get more consensus from people who are from the from more Jewish, more religious uh, uh, um, point of view, and to say, Look, this is the first time that we write in a basic law that Israel is not just a democracy, it's also a Jewish state. So this is, this is in the first paragraph. And after there is some kind of Bill of Rights, and I will, uh, I will just trans uh, uh, I will stop the, the, uh, the presentation, and I want to show the law itself. Just a second. Okay, um, we can see that there is a uh, protection of the right, of course, of human dignity. This is the, the, the most important uh, right in this. Violate the life, body, dignity of human being as such property. Uh, there is also about um, the body and the liberty and uh, issues of privacy. Um, but you don't see some important things that you might want to see in, uh, uh, in a Bill of Rights. There is no right for equality because of the uh, differences. It was taken out of the law. And also, for example, no freedom of speech there. So until today, we don't have a basic law or actually a regular law, no law that says that we have a right for equality or, or a law that says that we have a right for freedom of speech. What we do have uh, as the, what we call the, um, uh, the clause that says, how can you violate a right? One is not to violate the rights according by this basic law. Um, um, we have a, a limitation clause that says, when can you violate uh, the law and, and the basic law? And it has some... Um, uh, in order to, to show that uh, the violation is constitutional, you have to show that it is a law and it's corresponded with the values of the state of Israel and it serves an appropriate purpose and to extend does not exceed what is required. Or oh, this is the proportionality. And, and you see it in a lot of constitutions, not in the United States Constitution, but in a lot of constitutions, you say, you see that all the rights are not... Um, uh, above anything, I mean, every right can be violated if you meet these terms. And you see that the first term is that you have to have a law. It means a regular law of the Knesset. And if, and now we have, of course, the debate, can the Supreme Court strike down a law which is unconstitutional? And a lot of people say the Supreme Court took the right for himself. There was no meaning from the Knesset to give him this right. Well, when you read the limitation clause, it is almost clear, almost trivial to uh, uh, interpret it as giving the Supreme Court this, right, this, this power. Because if, the, law, if the, the fact that it is a law is only the first condition, 
then why, why do we have all the other conditions? If any law of the Knesset can uh, override the basic law, then they, they would just have to say, well, all these rights can be violated if the Knesset uh, 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 legislates a law. But no, it says that the law has to be for appropriate purpose, appropriate purpose and it has to be uh, proportion, proportional and all the other conditions. It means that there can be laws of the Knesset that not, don't meet these criteria. And therefore, someone has to uh, rule, is it constitutional or not? And also, I have, a, I think, a very strong um, uh, a powerful uh, proof that the Knesset did uh, intent, or at least did know that the Supreme Court will have the power to strike down Knesset law. Look at uh, paragraph 10. This basic law shall not affect the validity of any law that existed before, prior to the inception of this basic law. Well, because of the issues of status quo of, uh, of religion and state, they said this basic law cannot affect the validity of all the laws that were in power today. What does that mean from all the laws from today and now? If this law has no power of uh, uh, affecting validity of any laws at all, you wouldn't have to write this paragraph. And of course, if you've written this paragraph, you say all the new laws that were enacted after 1992 are um, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court can have what we call judicial review, constitutional review over whether it's constitutional or not. And this is exactly how the Supreme Court interpreted it. It happened in 1995. It took a few years until the Supreme Court decided in a very famous uh, ruling that the, the interpretation that I, that I presented about this law, this is our law. Well, so we can, they said, uh, have constitutional review. We can strike down laws if they are not proportional, if they, of course, if they violate the rights that are written in the law, uh, if they are not proportional, if they are, or if they are not for per, proper purpose. Um, but they didn't do it in this specific uh, verdict. In this specific verdict, they say, well, this law is okay. It is uh, co uh, constitutional because it's uh, proportional. It took a few more years before they strike down first uh, a law, and until today, which is now 25 years from 1995, they strike down 20 times laws. I must say, in the recent 10 years, they did it a lot more often. But and still, the total times that they strike down law was only 20 times. And if you hear what Knesset members are saying, sometimes it sounds like it happens every day or every week or every month. And when you look at the big picture, it happens about once a year. Even in the recent years, it can maybe happen two times in a year. Uh, and, and I have to tell you, when I read the verdict of the Supreme Court, they, are, they, do, they go above and beyond not to strike down Knesset laws. If they can, they say, well, this law, let's see how it goes. Let's see how it is implemented. You see how the Supreme Court does respect the Knesset. And of course, I don't say that they, they never strike down laws because they did. But if you, you look at the big picture, of course, Almost nothing that deals with security ever been struck down. Almost nothing. Uh, most of the time that they did inter, um, uh, go into the, the law and sometimes strike it down, in the recent years, were issues first about um, the uh, people from Africa. I'm not saying, uh, I'm not, asylum seekers, you can call them, you can call them, uh, uh, trespassers, it doesn't matter, but you know what I mean. They did uh, strike down four times laws that did that with them because they, the Supreme Court, they feel that this is a uh, uh, people, they, they don't have any representation and someone has to protect their rights. And second is the, the issue of the, uh, the ultra-Orthodox and the army. This is, again, something that they are active. But I must say that in a lot of other issues, they are very passive, and they give a lot of credit for the Knesset, and they, they don't want to in, intervene. 
Um, one other thing that I, ha I had to say, I have to say, although the Supreme Court uh, only interpreted this law as giving him uh, the right, because it's not written there. It's not written anywhere that the Supreme Court has the power to strike down Knesset laws. And this is why there is all the uh, criticism about the Supreme Court. But when you read the basic law of judiciary, you see that there is no other power that can, could do it. it. It's very clear that the Supreme Court is uh, the body that has power to give, um, to, to, to interpret laws and to decide about law, issues of law. They have very, very wide uh, uh, powers in the basic law of judiciary. Um, but I do have to stress that they were uh, active in some issues because they, for example, interpret the, the term human dignity very widely. They said, for example, that if you, um, it was in, for example, in the issue of Alice Miller, that she was a, a, a woman that wanted to become a pilot. And the, the army said, we are not accepting uh, women for the, for the um, uh, course of um, being a pilot. Uh, so the Supreme Court said, when you discriminate someone for who he is, actually when you violate his right for equality, but they said, when you discriminate someone according to his race, according to his gender, according to his some kind of, uh, 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 you know, LGBT, uh, because he is gay or something like that, they said, this violates his human dignity. This, and, and therefore, they say we can strike down also laws that go against equality, although it's not written there. They also said uh, when you um, make a law that is um, blocking people's mouth, shutting your mouth, it also violates your dignity. And in that way, they actually, and also about if they violate your right for um, religious freedom, which is also not written in the law, or the, the, the right from religious, the right to be an atheist. And in a way, the Supreme Court, in a, uh, a series of decisions, did interpret human dignity as a bill of rights that is not written there. And therefore, in that, um, I, I should agree, I must agree that the Supreme Court was active on this issue, and they said human dignity is actually a total uh, bill of rights, and therefore now, the, the nowadays uh, um, situation of law in Israel is that we, although we don't have a complete written human rights, we have a complete human, uh, uh, we have a complete bill of rights, which is, some of it, some of it is written, and some of it is in verdicts of the court. Uh, so this was the big role of the court. But still, I think the biggest role, role was of the Knesset when they uh, legislated uh, the basic law of uh, human dignity and equality and uh, uh, liberty. I will stop this and I go back to, to the presentation just for a few more remarks. Um, Okay. Uh, some people ask, so what is missing from the fact that we don't have a constitution? And I will just, well, we don't have a complete Bill of Rights, like I said, and it has importance because it's not written, and therefore there is always criticism of the court. Where is, why did you do this uh, interpretation role? And therefore it's lacking. We need to have a, a written right for freedom of speech, for equality, for religion, it is lacking. It's, and, and you know, a constitution has not only um, a legal power, a legal uh, role, it has a edu an educational role. And, we, and I think when someone is reading our constitution, we are lacking these components and it's a, a problem on the educational way. Uh, and the, I will summarize the most important thing that we don't have on this basic law is stability. These, these basic laws can be altered and changed very easily on a majority of 61. 61 is just 51% in Israel uh, parliament. And you have to understand, and it's 
you don't see any constitution like that in the world that the parliament can change with a regular majority on one day. They can have all the free readings in one day, and, and it's not a theoretical uh, thing. It is done. Although very important laws do take time sometimes, but not always. Sometimes it's just one day or a few days, even if it's very important changes to the, to the system, to the way the, the election is going, to the, to the government, and also it can happen with human rights. So we don't have this stability, this protection that says, even if a majority wants to do something, they have to, to have supermajority, they have to go to, for example, to two houses of parliament, to go to the people for, uh, uh, they, they need to, to get, uh, to, to go through election. There are a lot of, in every constitution in the world, there are a lot of um, means of protecting the constitution from a fast change or uh, like a revolution. We don't have this protection. This is why we are in a very uh, fragile situation that a majority of 61 can change everything. Uh, this is an important thing that I wanted to say. As I said about the implication that the Supreme Court um, uh, strike down only 20 times though, but of course there is in indirect implications. For example, I, I'm in the Knesset a lot in the deliberations in the committees, and they do take it, uh, if the legal advisor of the committee thinks that the, the Supreme Court will strike down this law, he, he says this is unconstitutional, you should change it. They are not obliged to change it, but they do change it because they don't want their law to be struck down. And in a way, of course, although we only have 20 cases, the implications are a lot broader. And of course, another important implication is the criticism. From 1995, the Supreme Court is under attack that it is uh, taking the power of the Knesset, that it is, uh, is this the real ruler of Israel, or the Supreme Court is like a supreme dictatorship leader, uh, and, and it has a price. The Supreme Court, uh, the faith of uh, the, the people in the Supreme Court has declined from 80% to 50-something in these days. But I have to say that the, the faith in the politics, <laughs> the politicians, is like 20%. So they are still have a majority that do support the Supreme Court. They still, um, and and I will I will say a few words words about the counter revolution. The counter revolution was is on the table for for like 10 years now, but it never had a majority in the Knesset. I think that. In our polls, they don't have a majority in the people, but also in the Knesset, there were always in the coalition uh, po politicians and, or uh, some components in the coalition that opposed the counter-revolution. And the counter-revolution is there are a lot of a, a, a lot of attempts how to to make it. One of it, in a way, succeeded. And this is the basic law, Israel nation, nation state of the Jewish people. I don't have time to elaborate on it. This is like a whole uh, uh, presentation. But I will just say one thing. I support the idea of Israel as a nation state of the Jewish people. But the law was designed in order to um, strengthen the, the Jewish part and to minimize the democratic part Israel is not, there is no, uh, it, it's not written that Israel is a democracy in this uh, basic law. It's not written that there is right for equality to all its citizens. So it's very not um, balanced. So, and, and the, the people who supported this law were, uh, were sincere. They say, we want to counter the, the revolution of Auenbach from 1992, so, or 1995. So, and, and I'm not sure they succeeded. With the, with the nation state law, but this is a long term process we'll have to see. But what they didn't succeed is with a lot of suggestions and bills to take away the power of the Supreme Court, for example, to make uh, an override law that the, the Knesset can always override uh, what the Supreme Court says. They also tried to, to influence the nominations for the Supreme Court. Today we have um, a committee that is also, uh, part of it are politicians, and part of it are judges, part of it are from the bar of Israel, and therefore and you have to have almost a consensus there, 
And therefore, the, the nominations to the Supreme Court are influenced by politicians, but they are not purely politi politi politic. But uh, uh, in, in, uh, in a lot of bills, they want to change it in order for it to be totally uh, uh, political uh, uh, nominations, which will make the Supreme Court a lot less independent. And in a way, it will take away our only um, uh, uh, tool of uh, uh, checks and balances. Uh, I don't have time to elaborate on the, on how this, the uh, checks and balances uh, it works in Israel, but if you know, uh, the, we have a parliamentary system. And it means that the government is always uh, in control of the Knesset, almost always. They have a majority because they are a coalition. And in a way, the only power to limit this power of the majority is in the Supreme Court, which is not dependent on that majority. But if the Supreme Court will be totally political, then the majority will have uh, power to, 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 to make the, the Supreme Court uh, political very fast. And it's not like in, this, in the United States that the nominations are for life and therefore it takes years and years to change the, the court. In Israel, the, the judges retire at the age of 70 and they are appointed uh, relatively in, in, uh, uh, like in their 50s or 60s. And it means that there are a lot of nominations. In every four years, they nominate like five or six or seven uh, judges to the Supreme Court. And it means that in a few terms, you can just take over the whole court. If the, if the nominations were totally political, I think that we have a good system of nominations because it has a political component. And I think that what Ayelet Chaked, uh, the former uh, minister of justice, did was totally legitimate. She took the, her power as uh, head of the uh, nominations committee and, and she did influence the court in order that there will be... Um, uh, judges that have um, um, a conservative uh, uh, point of view, and it's totally okay. But we, in order that we have other uh, ways, uh, other point of view, like more liberal uh, 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 judges, we need to have this um, um, system of nominations that do uh, take also uh, people who are not political with people who are political. I think I'll finish now uh, and take some questions. Thank you very much, Amir. Um, I want to just, uh, as a point of clarification, um, you mentioned Aaron Barak a couple of times. For those that don't know, Aaron Barak mm -hmm. was president of the Supreme Court at the time of these uh, basic laws being passed, and that's why uh, he is one of those, um, uh, one of the, he, some people say that he's uh, responsible for, for that. For I, I have to say, reference. I have to say that on this, this most important uh, uh, verdict in 1995, uh, also uh, the president of the Supreme Court then, uh, uh, um, Shamgar, also signed it. And they were together on that. And Shamgar is always uh, people who say he was very conservative. And, and, um, but they signed the same verdict on that 1995 uh, it was when Shamgar was retiring and passing to our own bar. Okay. Um, can you, uh, I wanted to, you mentioned the issue of um, asylum seekers from Africa as one of the cases, one of the examples where the Supreme Court has stepped in. Um, yeah. Can you maybe just for the, the sake of, um, so that people understand better, give, an, give one more example of say mm -hmm. like a high profile case one of the one of the 20 cases where the supreme court has overturned a law in this in this period on this issue of asylum seekers or other no, no, not necessarily no, oh. no just okay. a, maybe like a, a high profile case so one, one of the things that maybe got people riled up about the uh, about the role of the of the supreme court as a as two activist or or whatever okay um I'll try to think about one of the most important ones. For example, we had um, most of the decisions are really on not uh, uh, issues that were very political or very debatable, really. For example, they strike down the law 
of uh, the um, taxation of the third, uh, someone who has free um, real estate, free homes, free uh, houses. And they strike it down on issues of procedure. There is also a lot of criticism about that, although this was not really a highly political issue. They strike down a law that says how many days can you hold uh, uh, a soldier in captivity when he is not yet charged. They, they strike down a law that says you cannot um, privatize a jail, like they did in the United States and in some places. They said that if you privatize a jail, it, 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 uh, it's an um, unproportional violation of human dignity. Never, if I put aside the asylum seekers, and if I put aside the issue of the ultra-Orthodox and the, the issue of uh, uh, enlisting to the army, most of the, um, almost all of the decisions that strike down laws were not on high-profile high uh, political issues. The most high-profile political issues were not strike down, like the Nakba law or the commit, uh, acceptance committees law. <laughs> Laws that were purely political issues, they tried to avoid it and they did avoid it. Uh, so I think that the criticism is mainly on the fact that they have the power to strike down laws. And the fact that some people see democracy, and maybe it's the time to say it, say, see democracy as majority rule, period. And if you see democracy as majority rule, period, you cannot live with this. Supreme Court, because who voted for them? They were not voted by the people. And if there is a body that was not voted by the people, then nothing can suppress this will of the people. And this is something that is not only heard in Israel in recent years, it is very common also in other places, in Europe and from the other side of the Atlantic. And therefore, it also... Uh, uh, thrives here, the fact that democracy is what the majority wants. And if the majority, even if it's only 61 majority in the Knesset wants something, nobody can tell the other. And therefore, of course, there is uh, uh, all the issue about the attorney general the attorney and the legal advisors who voted for them. Why can they say anything? Everything should be only on the majority rule. And therefore, for, that's why we, you need to have uh, an override clause. If there is majority, they say, well, okay, we read the, the uh, verdict of the court, but there is a majority that thinks uh, different. And even, uh, and maybe I'm going for, for something else here, but you see it in last elections in Israel, the debate was about Netanyahu and about the fact that he is indicted uh, for uh, corruption. But a lot of people say, well, if the majority of the people want someone who is corrupt, then he should be the um, prime minister. They say it. It's like an, an acquittal by the people. You hear it. I don't say that this is the majority, but you hear it because the, the, what the majority wants is what should happen in a democracy. And when I, for example, come to the Knesset to try to say, well, this law should, might of, um, uh, damage our democracy, the, the answer sometimes is, well, who elected you? This is undemocratic. Democracy is only a procedure. Democracy is only a way of voting. And democracy is only uh, election. <laughs> and of course, I don't agree with that and because I support liberal democracy and because I actually think that if democracy is illiberal, like Orban says in Hungary, it's not a real democracy. When there's no freedom of press, when, there, when the election is not, uh, how can you have a real election? Even if you down, uh, even if you narrow democracy only for election, the election has to be after there is free uh, freedom of speech and unless that if if it's not after freedom of speech then there is no real election free election and therefore i don't agree with this idea of illiberal democracy uh but this is actually the 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 
the dispute here. Right. I think it's um, several, a few months ago, actually, uh, on in one of these sessions, uh, I was doing a, a session with Dan Murray Dorr um, about, about liberal nationalism. And as you mentioned, Dan Murray Dorr, not incidentally, was the justice minister at the time uh, that this was passed. Yeah. And one of the points he made was that um, th this idea that because the um, because the judiciary is unelected, um, it's it's somehow inferior to the elected representatives of the people is completely missing the point, because the, the fact that they're unelected is, is, is exactly the point that you need to have a body that is not dependent on the will of the people that is that is that can that can look dispassionately at the issues and doesn't have to win votes at the next election in order to in, in order to influence its uh, its decisions it's a counter majoritarian uh, body right on, on the definition that's, that's right. the check right that's the check and balance yeah right. um okay let's get to some questions um so uh, linda asks what about the supreme court preventing terrorists homes being destroyed um what about IDF decisions being overturned? Well, actually, the Supreme Court never uh, um, said that there is no power to to demolition to demolish uh, um, um, terrorist ho houses. They do check specific cases if there is enough evidence, or, for example. Did the family know anything about it? But the fact is that the Supreme Court, and there is a lot of criticism on the Israeli Supreme Court, that it never said, well, this is um, demolishing a house of people who are innocent. And the Supreme Court never said that. And if you ask other, um, and, I, and I meet sometimes in conferences, people who are uh, terrorist um, specialists, specialists from other places, other, other democratic states, they would never hear of this kind of uh, punishment. For example, it happens also, of course, if the terrorist dies, so you only punish his family. And I must say that the Supreme Court is totally not activist on the security issues. It allowed for us, for example, when on Rabin's a, a, a government to deport hundreds of Hamas people to Lebanon. We, they allow even our own barracks, verdict allowed in a way, uh, I, I can call it torture, some other people in, 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 the, in the verdict, it was called applying uh, reasonable force or something like that in the investigation. It is totally not a, a trivial for a Supreme Court to allow that they allowed um, almost every measurement uh, that uh, uh, the IDF asks or the Shabak, when they come to the Supreme Court, they have a strong um, opinion from the, um, uh, from the security people, not from the politicians. When the security, when the head of IDF will come to the Supreme Court and say, this is vital, to prevent terrorism, the Supreme Court will never go against it. They might say, well, you can do it in, in some specific ter conditions or, or stuff like that. But, in, but actually, the Supreme Court is, I think, in my opinion, not limiting uh, the power of, of our security uh, bodies. One, there was a question which was um, somewhat related because it also refers to the security issues, uh, which uh, Annie makes the point that the Supreme Court did step in and change the route of the security fence. Yeah, I, I didn't say that they never say anything. Hmm. Uh, if, if they would never say anything, then we can just put a rubber stamp there and not a, a, a body of, of judges. But they did allow for the fence to, to be built. But they say, well, in this issue, it's unproportionate because you can... Proportionality mainly means that you can achieve the same goal by hurting less rights. It's, it, it is sometimes uh, uh, people explain it like you want to kill a mosquito with uh, a big, uh, you know, with, with a strong uh, uh, 
think that will just ruin the whole world. Well, they said, and, and I agree, uh, that they do stuff, and they sometimes say, well, you cannot demol demolish this specific house. But when you look at the big picture, they almost always, they never say, well, this measurement is totally unconstitutional. You can never use it. You never had a single uh, verdict like that. Okay. Um, here's a question from uh, Robin who asks, and I, I, I think this is in, I guess this is in reference to um, talking about Israel as a, as a Jewish and democratic state. Um, Robin says, what do you think of some Arab Palestinian Israelis, for example, in the joint list, describing Israel as an ethnocracy? Well, I don't agree with them. I don't agree. I think we are a democracy. I think we are a democracy. Uh, I don't say that we are perfect, but actually, I don't know a lot of perfect democracies. We do have the problems, but we are under extreme danger, I think, not like other democracies because of the fact that everything can be changed very easily. And also I think that since the, the, the nation state law passed, I think that Arabs justifiably, or and it is justified that they feel that we have now a basic laws that treats them as they are just they live here, but they are not full citizens like everybody else. And in that mean, in, in that meaning, I think I don't think it has. There is a, a lot of uh, debate whether it will have legal implications. The nation state law, but in the um, message implications, Symbolic. it happened. Yeah. They took the message, and I think justifiably, it was the real message of this law that this is the state of the Jews, and it is a problematic message. And when I think of my children, that they read this basic law, what will they understand? Arabs are not mentioned there. It doesn't say that this is a, a democratic state. It doesn't have, says that there is a right uh, for um, equality. Then we have a problem there. But I don't say, say that this is an ethno state. No. OK. Um... Question from uh, Le Leah, there's actually two Leahs asking questions. Leah Wiener asks, um, what's your opinion about the regulations, uh, the current regulations uh, oh. around Corona? Oh, this is a big question. And, and I, I was there in the whole uh, deliberations in the Knesset. IDI presented a lot of um, opinion papers and, and we also influenced the, the Corona law and the, the the measurements and the, the powers that it gives the, the government. I'm not from the people who think that this whole lockdown is political. I think that we, we are dealing with a, a real problem and a real uh, pandemic and a real, some kind of catastrophe in Israel, what we had a, a, a week ago. The numbers were, were crazy. I do have criticism. I do have criticism, for example, on this, the amendment that they did in the law in order to limit the protest. I thought, I thought that they could, li not just to limit the, the protest, it was almost to ban the protest. Now they have power to ban the protest. They didn't use it fully because they said you can protest a thousand meters from your home, but they have power to say you cannot protest at all. They didn't use it yet, but the fact that the law gives them the power to do that is very problematic, I think. And also the fact that, for example, you cannot even alone go and protest in front of the Knesset is very problematic. I think that they could limit the protest, but they shouldn't have banned it or give the government the power to ban it. And of course, I have a lot of criticism on some parts of the uh, uh, regulations. Some are irrational from my point of view, but if you ask me as a whole, um, if I look at, or if I answer to the question that say, well, we became a dictatorship, uh, there is no democracy in Israel because of the corona, and this is totally political, I don't agree with it. We are not dictatorship. There is still a Supreme Court that reviews everything. There is still the Knesset that reviews, reviews it. And still, I think that it was not, I, I, I think that it might have been, it might, uh, it, it, I think it was sometimes used as power also to, to, to gain political uh, uh, power, but uh, 
on, 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 on a big picture, it was justified. At least most of the measurements and the regulations are justified. Uh, I think that we have a very big problem of a lack of faith on the government, uh, which is in a way justified when you see how they themselves respect the regulations. And when you see, uh, when you know, um, I think the, the, the fact that we have uh, a prime minister which is under uh, uh, indictment of bribery from the beginning creates a lack of trust in what he does. Every, even when he does good things, people say, well, it's just because of his, uh, of his trial. And this is the basic problem that we have from this establishment of this uh, government. That last point makes it leads me very nicely onto the, onto another question from Leia Yerushalmi, who asks, and I'm, I'm going to read it out as it's written, um, because it's she's expressing a, a personal opinion here. Um, she says, if it's true that a person in Israel is considered innocent until proven guilty, why can the anti-Netanyahu media and politicians persist that Bibi can't be the prime minister if he's still only under indictment? He hasn't been proven guilty yet of anything. Okay, well, this is totally not uh, relevant for our uh, presentation, but I did talk about it, so it is yeah. relevant you're, in a way. You're here, you're the guy in the, in the hot seat. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I can answer to that. Well, first, I don't agree with the, the fact that we have an anti bb media. We have a very uh, variations in the media. We have a lot of pro bb media. And we have, I think, equal media in that case. But even if we agree, and I don't agree, I don't agree with the, the verdict of the Supreme Court that said that he can still be in, in his office. I think they made a mistake. But I respect what the, the, the verdict is of the Supreme Court. And therefore, this is the law now. The law is now that he can be in, in his office. But still, there is the moral question. And of course, it is part of democracy for people to claim you cannot stay in your office, not legally, but morally. And people can protest about it and people can say that it has problems, not only on the moral uh, uh, issue, on, also on the practical issues. They said, for example, uh, when he deals with the, um, um, with the Ministry of Justice, when he's now will he will be part of the nomin uh, nominations for um, chief um, Patitam Dina, uh, state attorney. State attorney. Yeah. There is clear contra con uh, contradiction of interest. So, of course, even the, the the fact that he was not yet that he was not convicted. Of course, there is. Um, uh, the, um, the fact that you, you don't put him to jail before he's uh, 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 convicted, but it doesn't mean that there is no implications. For example, a minister which is indicted has to step down, and this is the law. It's not written law, but it is under uh, the, the uh, verdicts of the court, and everybody accepted it. And of course, any other civil any other uh, uh, civil servant, sometimes they have to step down even when there is just investigation. So where is the presumption of innocence there? Because presumption of innocence is that you don't send someone to jail. But if there is a four and a half years investigation and decisions by a lot of uh, ranks in the prosecution, and at the end, the attorney general decided to indict someone with bribery, it is at least legitimate to say or to ask or to protest and say, we don't want this kind of uh, uh, prime minister. I think it is totally legitimate, even if it's not based on a legal uh, stand, it is on the moral stand. And of course, if any other uh, civil servant, or not just civil servant, every other people who works in every place was fired, when he was indicted, uh, I don't see anything illegitimate by calling for a prime minister to resign. Right. Um, Annie uh, has pointed out in the chat that when Ehud Olmert was um, yeah. not, even, not even yet indicted, but was about to be indicted, 
the, well, the leader of the, the leader of the opposition, Benjamin Netanyahu, <laughs> called on him to uh, sure. to, to step down. Um, sure. Okay, um, question here from uh, from Jacqueline, who asks. She asked about this is going back to the current Corona situation, um, but she asked if the Supreme Court has any power to enforce um, the rulings, and she's particularly concerned about certain populations. Um, like the Haredim that seem to be en masse um, violating the uh, social distancing and, and other regulations. Can the Supreme Court get involved in that? Yes, if, if someone will petition, if there will be strong evidence that the police is not enforcing, because the Supreme Court will not enforce by himself, he can give a writ, can for the, the, the police to enforce the law. But I don't think we do have this kind of uh, strong evidence. I mean, whenever there are evidence for that, the police is starting to, to, to do stuff. I, I mean, of course we have, I am suspicious about what's going on with uh, the um, enforcement of laws, but I don't think we are in the situation that there is no enforcement and we have to use the Supreme Court. But theoretically, yes, the Supreme Court can give writ. And of course, there is always the question of what will happen if the government will not respect uh, the verdicts of the Supreme Court? Then we might have uh, like a civil war. <laughs> but because if the Supreme Court will give a, a final decision and the government will totally disregard it, then we're in a state of chaos and we're not there. They always respected it. And now maybe someone will say, well, what happened with Yuli Edelstein? Well, Yuli Edelstein did do something very rude in my point of view, but he did step down. He said, I cannot do what you want me to do, but I'm stepping down. And therefore, he just postponed the whole process for one more day. This and in a way, he did respect. In a way, he did Yuli respect. Edelstein, Yuli Edelstein in his role as Speaker of the Knesset. This, this is yeah. We had a, an issue after the last election. He refused to convey the Knesset in order to elect a new chairman. And the Supreme Court gave him a writ to do it. And he said, I cannot do it. And therefore, I resign. And he knew that by resigning, it will happen anyway. Uh, so, and this was really uh, maybe the closest case of not respecting the value of the Supreme Court. And we are still in a point that verdicts of the Supreme Court are respected by the government. If they won't be, we're in a state of chaos. Okay. Um, one last question. Uh, this is a kind of, uh, this is a question from me. Um, it's a general question. Um, you, when you, you talked about the, uh, the appointment process and how judges are chosen for the Supreme Court, and you mentioned how Ayala Shaked as Justice Minister obviously a more right-wing justice minister, someone who does in fact want to uh, um, uh, uh, cut back the power of the Supreme Court. Um, and she did in her role ensure that there was, I, I think uh, one, maybe two more conservative justices admitted to the, yeah. more than that? More like three or four. Ah, okay, you know, okay. You know, it's a, it's okay. a spectrum. <laughs> okay, so what, I guess my question is, what is it in the Israeli context because um, Americans know what, what a liberal judge and a conservative judge means in America, right? And it has particular connotations on very American issues around, you know, mm -hmm. guns and abortion and these kinds of things. But in the Israeli context, when we talk about a conservative justice rather than a liberal one, what does that mean? And does that, does that, have, does that mean that a conservative, what we would call a conservative judge in Israel, would be um, less likely to implement Interview. judicial review, that they would yes. be against the principle of judicial review? Yes, yes. Right. Not against the whole um, idea, maybe some of them, yes, but, but just uh, if you think of the volume, they will intervene a lot less. They will, in, in a lot more cases, they will say, maybe I don't like this, but it's not my place as a Supreme Court to, to intervene because this should be only on the political uh, the, the political branch, they should decide on that. It doesn't mean that we don't have any authority, but we are only going in in the very, very extreme cases. This is, this is what conservatism means on this issue. And also, of course, when you balance uh, security versus human rights, they will probably uh, be more on the security issues 
and some of them also in the issues of religious issue will be more on the religious issues. This is maybe the most uh, important divisions uh, that you can think of uh, about conservatism in Israel, the issue of religion and the issue of uh, security. Right. Okay. Um, well, I, thank you very much, uh, Amir Fuchs. That was really enlightening. And, and I think that um, this, is, this is an issue which I, uh, I think is going to be increasingly, um, increasingly important and urgent, um, maybe in connection with uh, what happens with Netanyahu, but also I think in the post-Netanyahu era, whenever that is, um, we'll see what, 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 in what, what direction Israeli politics goes. But it does seem like there is a, um, a, a body of opinion in the Knesset these days, which is which is against um, the 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 role of the, the current role of the Supreme Court um, after the, the the constitutional revolution. So thank you very much for educating us. Um, thank you for having me, and thank you everyone for for listening and uh, participating. Thank you. Um, there is applause which you can't hear because people's. I see. It. Thank you. Um, right, you said you often. Um, okay, to everyone else, thank you very much. Um, next week we'll have the final lecture in this series. Um, we're going to be looking at um, about the decline of the Israeli uh, left as a result of um, the, the failure of the peace process and um, everything that came from that. Um, but we, are, we will be meeting next Wednesday as usual. Um, anyone that wants to get on my mailing list who is not already on it can email me, Paul Gross, Paul G at begincenter.org.il. That's paul g at begincenter.org.il. Uh, also, the information should be on our Facebook page and our website. And with that, I will wish you all good day or good evening, depending where you are in the world. And Chag Sameach, Bye.